There are a ton of other videos out there about RV solar installations, but not a whole lot about how it's been working out for them down the road. We completed our 2.6 kilowatt system back in July, and now that it's been six months, I wanted to follow up with how things have been working out, lessons learned, and maybe a few things that we might have done differently. If you haven't seen our other solar videos, you might want to go back and watch those first. In part one, I go over our lithium battery bank upgrade, as well as the installation of our two 3 kilowatt inverters. Part two is the rest of our solar power system installation, which includes 15 flexible solar panels, as well as three charge controllers. All right, it has been six full months now since we completed our installation, and we've had lots of opportunities now to make use of it. Just to name a few, we boondocked in Northwest Montana in the Kootenai National Forest, at the Wedge on Utah's Little Grand Canyon, on the shore of Utah Lake near Salt Lake City, as well as lots of other overnight stays while traveling. And we're using it again here in Arizona. We even found ourselves in a situation where we might have missed out on an opportunity to see a really neat place had we not had it. This happened to us at Valley of Fire State Park in Nevada. This park has two campgrounds and they're both first come first served. All of the sites with hookups were already taken when we got there, and the other campground had both no hookups and limited use times for running a generator. Thankfully, we still had all the power we needed and had a great stay. We really don't have any regrets with our system, but there are some limitations worth mentioning. If you're considering putting big bucks into a large solar power system for your RV, please understand that there really is no substitution for a full 50 amp connection that you can get at a campground. With 2600 watts of solar panels on the roof, there's an awful lot that we can do, but it isn't limitless power. On a travel day, we can do pretty much whatever we want, and that's because the system then recharges while we're driving. But once we're stationary for a couple of days or a week or more, there's a little bit more that goes into power management so that we don't run the battery bank down. The original purpose of our big solar install was to be able to run our main AC unit in the summertime. On a typical summer day, I usually want to turn it on around noon. And since the days are long, we usually only go through about 20% of the battery bank overnight. And that easily recharges by noon. So when this thing is running, it usually takes about 1400 watts and then add a few lights running our laptops and of course having the fridge running we'll easily see about 16 to 1700 watts of draw on the system but since the sun is also high in the summertime we'll easily see 2000 watts of power coming down from the roof and that's all the power that we need under ideal circumstances, when we were parked at the Wedge in Utah, we got as high as 2,280 watts from the roof. That was pretty good. If it's really hot and we need to run both AC units at the same time, we can see as high as 3,200 watts of draw on the system. That does begin to run the battery bank down. Now, as it starts to cool off inside, the AC units do cycle on and off a little bit, which makes our power calculations a little bit more complicated, but if we know we're going to boondock in really hot temperatures, we just plan on running our little Honda generator to support the system when we're being really power hungry. And that doesn't happen very often. Winter is a completely different story. Our peak power usage during the day is way less, but the sun's also a lot lower in the sky and we have a lot fewer hours of daylight. So it isn't uncommon for us to go through 50% of the battery bank overnight with our normal power usage and running the propane furnace. It also makes a big difference which direction the trailer is pointed because the roof slopes down a little bit. So ideally we would try to point that south but in reality, we haven't really been able to do that because the places we've stayed, the campsites just haven't been oriented that way. The worst possible solar power situation that we've been in to date was actually in that scenario I mentioned earlier at Valley of Fire State Park in Nevada. 
The slope of the trailer had the solar panels actually tilting away from the sun. And to make matters worse, we were parked next to this huge sandstone rock that cast a shadow across the trailer by about 2.30 in the afternoon. We still went through 50% of the battery bank that night, but because we got up really early the next morning to go explore, I shut off everything in the trailer except for the fridge. And by the time we got back around 1230, it had still managed to recharge everything. The peak wattage that we saw that day was only 800 watts. On a typical winter day and in a more normal scenario, we usually see 12 to 1300 watts coming down from the roof. And when we're at home with our typical power usage, we still recharge our batteries by about 2 p.m. I think the only other scenario I haven't touched on yet is weather. A partly cloudy day usually reduces our wattage by about 15%, which doesn't make that big of a difference for us. A really heavily clouded day will reduce it by 50%. And so far, the worst offender of reduced solar power has been tall trees. Thankfully, so far in our travels, we really haven't been in a scenario where we had a lot of cloudy days back to back, but we're sure it's coming at some point. Okay, on to lessons learned and things that I might have done differently, and really not much. I will point out that I was wrong about the shadows cast by the AC units. They're not a big deal at all in the summertime, but in the winter, they're definitely longer and more noticeable. But I'm not sure that that really amounts to something I would have done differently because it's not like I could have moved those solar panels any further away than I did. So it is what it is. The other thing worth pointing out is that many of these cable ties have failed. Some of them held together pretty well, many did not. I got that idea from another YouTube video that I watched where they said you could put down a cable tie and then reinforce it with roof repair tape. So in the sections where they failed, I ended up just taping the PV wire directly to the roof. I also need to give the panels a light cleaning every couple of weeks. And that about sums up our six month solar update. Hopefully it gives you a little bit more of an idea as to what having a large RV solar setup is really like. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and feel free to leave any questions you have in the comments below. We'll see you on the next adventure. We plan to do a lot more boondocking this year, visit some national parks and take you along on other adventures. Our channel will continue to feature a mix of RV life, how-to videos and family travel. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you're notified the next time we release a video. See you soon.